This is a production of WTVI PBS Charlotte. Just ahead on Carolina Impact. It's a makeover for a 60 year old arena without losing 60 years of memories. I'm Jeff Sonier. Stick around, we'll take you inside, show you what's going on at Bojangles Coliseum coming up. Plus, meet a man who refuses to let his disability slow him down. Hear how he lost the ability to walk but gained a new perspective on life. And in our One Tank Trip series, grab a towel. You may get wet on this adventure. Don't go anywhere. Carolina Impact starts right now. WTBI PBS Charlotte presents Carolina Impact, covering the issues, people, and places that impact you. This is Carolina Impact. Funding for Carolina Impact is provided by the members of WTVI PBS Charlotte and by the Philip L. Van Avery Foundation is pleased to support our region's arts organizations and artists with profiles and feature stories on Carolina Impact. Good evening. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm Amy Burkett. At age 60, the original Charlotte Coliseum, now known as Bojangles Coliseum, has had a little work done. You could call it a major facelift. New seats and colors, a new scoreboard, and a new home team that's really not so new. But they're not changing everything, as the Coliseum also tries to preserve what's made it so special for so long. Tonight, we begin a special series called Remember When. You'll see segments here on CI over the next six to eight months, and we hope to turn your memories into a documentary early next summer. Carolina Impact's Jeff Sonier joins us outside the Coliseum with more on what's new inside. Hey, Jeff. You know, Amy, I actually saw Michael Jackson and the Jackson 5 here on stage back in the early 80s, either 81 or 82, I'm not sure which. But when you have a building with this much history, well, that's what you get. An awful lot of those same sort of I remember when type moments. On the outside, maybe the Coliseum is just another aging Charlotte landmark. You know, that halfway point you glance at out your window on the long drive to and from work every day. But on the inside of this old dome. I'm here in Charlotte, North Carolina. This is my home. Well, it's kind of a time machine, taking you back to the early days of a much younger Billy Graham. I'm proud of this city. I love this great state of North Carolina. From the mountains to the sea, no more beautiful place in the world to live. Or your favorite TV wrestler. The heavyweight champion of the world from Charlotte, North Carolina. 240 pounds, nature boy, Rick Flair. Burn in love, baby. Or maybe even the king himself. Lord of mine, I'll be my temperature rising. Yeah. Higher, higher, it's running through the soul. Sometimes all in one busy week. But yeah, it was a great experience to see not only the sporting events, but the concerts and the family shows and everything else uh, that played this building growing up as a kid. George Height started out as a Coliseum usher back in high school. Now he walks the floor of Bojangles Coliseum as its general manager, overseeing a $16 million fix-up that hopefully picks up on what makes the Coliseum special. The facelift includes almost 9,000 new plastic seats filling the Coliseum, similar to these original slatted wooden seats they replaced, minus, of course, the 60 years of scrapes and scratches. There are new speakers, too, to help fill the Coliseum with music, but no plans to replace this original Coliseum organ, either. As you look around the building, we did a lot of painting and touch-up, things like that, to bring out some of the new colors, but the building still has that charm and intimate feeling. The dome ceiling really wasn't touched, other than some new lighting and, and new sound and things like that. So the, the domes really still gives it that feeling from the 50s and 60s that made this building uh, so powerful and such an appealing place to be. Welcome back my friends to the show that never ends. We're so glad you could attend. Come inside, come inside. The Coliseum Dome, despite a damaging drop-in from Mother Nature back in 1958, has survived to host generations of pop singers and presidential candidates. 
circus acts, and sports stars. Here he is, Mike Jordan, with his first rebound ever. Including a certain future Tar Heel Hall of Famer, seen here in his first year, in his first game, not in Chapel Hill, but instead on the Coliseum hardwood. Jordan, the freshman, started the fast break, has the assist, and Worthy scores. And now, after months of work on its midlife makeover, Bojangles Coliseum is welcoming back some old friends. Yet the Charlotte Checkers return this season to the Coliseum that was their home for over 30 years, starting back in 1956 when they moved from Baltimore. Well, that's very important. Your home is, uh, is at a rink, and you know, when you've got a, a, a building like that that has a bunch of history in it, and then you're also walking into one that's refurbished and, and the things are new and bright, uh, it's pretty exciting. Pretty exciting for the fans, too. I like section 108 or 123, doesn't matter which one. Sandy Simpson got her tickets early for Checkers opening night. Back at the arena where she and her future husband were regulars back in the late 60s and early 70s. We started dating. He asked me if I'd like to go to a hockey game. I'd never been to one. When you heard they were coming back to the old arena, what was your first reaction? I was reaction? very excited and something that we really want to get back into going and doing. I can't wait to see what it looks like inside. Mm -hmm. So we decided to give Sandy a little sneak peek. The Coliseum makeover not quite finished, but still pretty impressive. How great, look at it. It looks just the same. We probably set, I think it was that side, and row L. They really seriously don't build them like that anymore. The workmanship and the amount of architecture that went into this building is truly unbelievable. And I think part of the reason this building is still strong and still vibrant today. Plus, a spiffed up Coliseum may be just what's needed to bring back a little luster to this cluster of closed down businesses nearby. The Coliseum and the auditorium is really anchors of the east side and the future development. So now, although Elvis has left the building, a whole new audience of concert goers and hockey fans is just arrived. And even though the Checkers will be playing more than 50 games a year here at the new Bojangles Coliseum, well, that still leaves lots of extra dates for concerts and other events, not to mention those traditional high school graduations that the old Coliseum is known for. Amy? Thanks so much, Jeff. It'll be exciting to see our first concert in that renovated facility. Well, here are a few fun facts. The Charlotte Coliseum was one of a kind when it opened in 1955, featuring the world's largest unsupported steel dome. Do you remember the original cost for the Coliseum and Ovens Auditorium next door combined? Well, back then it was just $4 million for both. Let's turn to education now. How do you help your kids develop a love of reading? When my 14-year-old son was just a baby, I loved snuggling up with him and reading a good book. We kept that tradition going for a very long time, really, until he refused to curl up with mom anymore because he thought he was just too big. It broke a mama's heart. But all that reading has helped him get off to a great start. I'm very proud of my freshman honor student at Nation Ford High School. According to the American Academy of Pediatrics, reading with children at an early age improves their development of language, literacy, and social emotional skills. Our next story focuses on a woman passionate about helping others develop early literacy skills. Our very own Beverly Dorn Steele recently celebrated her 35th anniversary here at WTVI PBS Charlotte. She's been committed to making a difference in the lives of others all these years. Carolina Impact's Jeff Rivenbark shows us how Miss Bev has made an impact on thousands with a little help from her friend Seymour. All right, the name of this book is Pete the Cat and his four groovy buttons. Colorful sneakers, shirts, and storytelling makes the Sugar Creek Library come alive. When Beverly Dorn Steele travels, she takes her friends like Cookie Monster. He still has his one chocolate chip cookie once a day, but mm, does he love those apples. From teaching healthy eating habits and reading skills, Miss Beverly, as the kids call her, warms up any group with her smile and energetic storytelling. Again, pop, pop, pop! Oh my goodness! Another button just popped off and rolled away. So how many buttons are left? One! Oh, very good. One button left. As WTBI's Education and Outreach Coordinator, Beverly works with schools, libraries, and child care providers throughout the area. I have worked with Miss Beverly for many years. We have a great partnership. 
Teresa Clay says a number of kids who come to the Sugar Creek Library don't receive quality reading time with adults at home. She is very creative in getting these kids, and not only the young, the kids, but the teachers involved and the parents involved with the various workshops. Talk about what you just watched. Like this one at Bethlehem Center Head Start. Each year, Beverly conducts nearly 100 workshops to introduce child care providers to educational resources available through PBS that can enhance learning and interaction with children. Beverly started working at WTBI in 1980 as a secretary. Within six months, I moved up into the production department and learned how to run camera and do different things there. And then I worked in programming and then into promotion and then the buzzword community outreach was born. While PBS programs many of us grew up watching like Sesame Street and Mr. Rogers Neighborhood have taken a backseat to today's more popular shows like Daniel Tiger's Neighborhood and Super Y, they share the same goal, helping children build literacy skills. I really get to see an impact on kids learning from watching PBS Kids Programming. Hey. Oh, that was a good story, Miss Beverly. Hey, can we make up our own story now? Okay, you start. Okay. Beverly introduced a new friend to WTVI viewers in the early 1990s. The first time I met Seymour Goodstuff and I looked into those big blue eyes, I mean, my heart melted. He and I meshed. She just took me under her wing as a young elephant and she said, why don't you come to the WTVI Kids Club Clubhouse and we'll hang out and do all sorts of fun stuff. After making hundreds of appearances on WTVI's Kids Club and out in the community, okay. Seymour says it's been great. I got to tell you, working with Miss Beverly all these years, all of my six years that I am perpetually stuck at, it has been fantastic. And making learning fun and exciting ignites a child's passion. Having worked in public education for 20 years in Charlotte, Jerry Hagler says she's seen firsthand Beverly's commitment to promoting literacy for underserved communities. She is there in every community, whether it's in a daycare or a library or partnering with a nonprofit organization, but she's reaching families who may not have had the opportunity to have books in their home or parents who may not be able to read themselves. A number of kids that I work with do live in um, predominantly uh, disadvantaged circumstances and it warms my heart to see them receive their first book. Here we go! Beverly also leads a number of community events like this one at the Harvest Center in West Charlotte which serves a high number of homeless and low-income residents. We had an opportunity to give back to the community by donating free PBS Kids educational resources that both the children and the parents could benefit from. The big impact she makes happens with one small group at a time. I think WTVI's Raising Readers program is now up to about 20,000 kids that we've reached over the years. A mother herself, Beverly never passes up an opportunity to remind other moms and dads about the impact literacy can have on their child's life. Spend time reading with your child. Allow them to ask questions. Talk about what you just read. Do an activity or an exercise after you've watched a PBS Kids program, after you've read a book. As for Seymour Good Stuff, he never passes up a chance to give a shout out for his best friend. I love Miss Beverly. She's the super best. Oh, Miss Beverly, you know I love you. <laughs> Waka. Back at the Sugar Creek Library, this visit comes to an end, but Beverly hopes it's the start of a new reading adventure that empowers these kids to stretch themselves academically in the years ahead. For Carolina Impact, I'm Jeff Rivenbark reporting. Thanks so much, Jeff. Joining me now is Joe Washington, who's known Beverly for about a decade and has worked in collaboration with the outreach team here at WTBI PBS Charlotte. Joe, thanks so much for your time. We appreciate you being here so much. Thank you. I'm happy. Talk to us about some of the collaborations that you've done with our PBS outreach program here. You have a special one to your heart with the Y Achievers. I sure do. <laughs> the Y Achievers program uh, was something that we wanted to get out of the ground several years ago. I, at the time, was a um, board member at Stratford Richardson as a volunteer, and I was charged with finding donors, finding sponsors, mentors, educators, all to develop this Y Achievers program. They found that in their research, at least 34% of our students weren't graduating on time. This really, really concerned the leadership at the Y. I right away knew who I needed to tap into. 
<laughs> Beth, with her vast experience in, in our community and in education, I was hoping I could go to her and get some counsel as to how to engage people. Community conveners, that's one of the things that's always such an honor to be a part of at the PBS station, to kind of bring people together to make an impact. So you worked with our PBS folks, and you saw some great impact with those students in the Y Achievers program, which is still an ongoing program, but tell us about ongoing the progress sure. so far. Just this year, just this year, several months ago, we were able to report that the Y Achievers program, sponsored through the Y, nurtured up to 115 students at three targeted schools, West Mech, West Charlotte, as well as Vance. And at those three schools, they're able now to report at least a 20% improvement in terms of closing that gap in graduations. That's marvelous. Because that sets those kids up for success for the rest of their lives. And as an executive coach, I mean, you probably see that, that connection with literacy, that connection to uh, being able to feel a part of something probably leads folks to success further on in their life as well. Yes, and that's what the Y Achievers program was really all about, was leadership development and career development. And we needed mentors, we needed interns, we needed sponsors, and WTVI with Bev stepped into that space for us. It's fun to be a part of the community and to make an impact. <laughs> well, you know, it's not just kids. You've worked in a way that how we've been able to harness mm -hmm. that convening with adults as well. Tell us a little bit about some adult programs that you've had connection with. Wow. I know there's a lot. Wow. Just pick one, we're running out of time. <laughs> Bev actually got the funding and did the leadership and the development for a WTVI Love and Forgiveness Campaign program. This program was for adults, lifelong learning experience so that they could find new ways, new ways to love and forgive, whether they had family um, grievances, whether they had community uh, racial tension issues. This was a way for them to do such. She engaged Charlotte Mecklenburg County's uh, Department of Parks and Recs, and they actually built a love and forgiveness garden in Freedom Park. And that's a place today where people come, walk the path of forgiveness, and find peace within themselves. Community collaboration is what it's all about. Joe Washington, a master coach, thank you so much. Your business is called Growth Resource International. We appreciate your time. You know, we want to work with you for many, many years to come and for the good of our community. Thanks so much. And I trust you will. Thank you. Let's switch gears and take a moment to imagine what life would be like if in an instant you were paralyzed. We often take for granted the freedom our ability to move brings to the quality of our life. Brian Muscarella lived an active lifestyle when suddenly a freak accident left him paralyzed from the shoulders down. Carolina Impact's Danielle Koser shows us how he's determined to never slow down. It's like the Iron Man suit. It comes down and it wraps around your legs and your chest and your waist. But Brian Muscarella doesn't get his superhero strength from this suit. It comes from his will to succeed. <sighs> Taking deep breaths and pumping his arms, he focuses on each step he takes. Supported by a harness, this is the closest he's come to walking in more than four years. At 53, Brian went to the emergency room after having chest pains and numbness in his arms. His condition quickly worsened. Uh, within a 24-hour period, I was paralyzed from my shoulders down. Doctors told Brian he suffered a rare spinal stroke caused by a disruption in the blood supply to the spinal cord. But what they couldn't figure out was why this happened to someone so active. An endurance athlete, Brian stayed in shape running marathons and skiing with his daughters. I want to do it again. <laughs> I mean, uh, my, I taught my girls how to ski. And one of the goals I want to do is uh, be able to ski with them again. It was devastating to my family and myself, uh, psychologically, mentally. I mean, it, it's a dramatic change to have someone say that you're paralyzed and recovery is unlikely. Doctors described it as a freak accident. I just took that to be my anthem. Brian's family and friends banded together to show him support, calling themselves Team Freak, inspired by the unusual diagnosis. He spent three days in the neurological intensive care unit, followed by a month of inpatient therapy at Carolina's rehabilitation. 
I was graced to have a great doctor and Dr. Latanya Lofton that understood that, that a cure is not about medicine. Sometimes it's about understanding what your patient needs. It was very encouraging to see him take what was, you know, by all accounts, a tragedy. And he used that to motivate himself to get better. Here, Brian worked on building his endurance and maintaining his strength using the Locomat, a robotic-assisted walking device. This machine does what three or four therapists would have to do. One of the things that has stood out for me with Brian is that no is not an option or impossible is not an option. He takes whatever limitation that is put in front of him. You may not walk again. You may not regain more strength. And he pushes it to the max. He gives more than 100% for everything that he does. After therapy, Brian began pushing himself through the Adaptive Sports and Adventures Program, or ASAP, at Carolina's Rehab. The program, funded solely by donations, provides people with physical disabilities the opportunity to participate in more than 15 adaptive sports, like hand cycling, water skiing, and rugby, at little or no cost. And one of the things through sports, it helps you get over those hurdles, instead of that being uh, I can't do this, okay, let's work around it, and we, and we because you're strong enough to do it. Looking good. The program also connects him with others who are facing similar or more severe injuries. You're on a team, you're participating, it's a lot of camaraderie, you're sharing stories. It takes the fear out of what's happened to you dramatically. Last season, the ASAP hand cycling team traveled across the Southeast, competing in 11 races. Ryan earned a spot on the podium for all three races at the Paracycling Nationals in Chattanooga, Tennessee. We do this to demonstrate the capabilities of the disabled rather than inabilities. Each year, Brian is one of nearly 50 cyclists who bike 180 miles to the Carolina coast, raising money for the adaptive sports program. During the ride, he's surrounded by Team Freak, family and friends who have been at his side since the diagnosis. You know, I, I say, um, you know, you never give up, never surrender. There's no choice. And how can I give myself a choice when I have this kind of support? Brian says adaptive sports help strengthen both his body and spirit, giving him new ways to enjoy the sports he's always loved. Now he continues adjusting to life adapted, staying focused on his goal to ski with his daughters again. For Carolina Impact, I'm Danielle Koser reporting. I had the good fortune of meeting Brian a few weeks back. He has an amazing can-do spirit. Thanks so much, Danielle, for sharing his story. Well, Ryan's been successful raising money for Carolina's healthcare system's Adaptive Sports and Adventures program, which helps others in similar situations stay active. To learn more about the program, we've got a link posted along with this story at pbscharlotte.org. Finally tonight, fall is a great time to enjoy the outdoors. Fortunately, it's still warm enough to go whitewater rafting and kayaking. So, pack up your paddles and outdoor gear. Tonight's One Tank Trip takes us to the U.S. National Whitewater Center. Producer Russ Hunsinger brings us highlights from when our staff set out on the adventure. Exhilarating. It is awesome. Phenomenal. What we try to do with this facility is make it kind of your full-on outdoor adventure facility. Not only do we have rock climbing and whitewater rafting, we have flat water kayaking and stand up paddle boarding on the Catawba River. We have numerous ropes courses and zip lines. Scary. Left, left, left. It's exciting. One. Fun all around. Properly fitting helmet, guys. We need Safety is our number one priority here. So we are going to have everybody that comes through, most of these activities are going to go through some type of safety talk. And that even goes to our ropes courses and zip lines. Now rafting is one of those that actually is guided. So we had somebody there in the boat with you, a professional guide, to take you down the river. Sometimes I feared uh, the boat capsizing. Because there's a few moments where uh, you know, you're either looking at the sky or you're looking straight down in the water as you're coming off of, uh, you know, drop-offs and whatnot. At other times, it was just listening and focusing on what the guide was telling us to do. You have the guide behind you yelling out, you know, two to the, you know, front, two to the back. Four, two. One more. You just follow the, the guide's commands and you hope that you stay upright and stay in the boat. If we hit a wall of water, to uh, get in the boat or lean to one side or to the other so that we didn't capsize. A lot of uh, 
uh, chaos at times, and then and then things get under control. And then with teamwork and whatnot, you just kind of navigate what's ahead of you. So not only are we just have activities out here, but we have some great dining opportunities and then music festivals. We do a lot of educational stuff out here as well. So we have school groups come out and do educational stuff. We have first aid classes going on. I mean, we have a variety of things that people probably don't even know that we offer out here. We can do corporate team building out here. Something else a lot of people don't know we do is summer camps. So even for kids in the summertime, this is a great location to bring them out for week-long day camps. I think this is a great thing to introduce to kids. My family and I actually just went whitewater rafting in North Carolina, and I have a son who's eight and a daughter who's 10. Heart right, heart right. And they found it to be fun. It's a great way to introduce them to water sports, get them outside, and uh, really just enjoy what the Whitewater Center has to offer. I was a little fearful of the unknown. I didn't expect, I didn't know what to expect. It turned out for the best. It was fun. Too many activities here not to, not to find one that you can enjoy. You cannot have a bad time. Thanks so much, Russ. It wasn't half as scary as I thought it would be. And guess what? I didn't even fall in. The U.S. National Whitewater Center is open year-round, weather permitting. Head to our website for a list of activities. That is one amazing hidden treasure of our region. Well, we love being your public television station and sharing your stories. So please send us your story ideas by emailing them to carolinaimpact.wtvi.org. And don't forget, we're still giving away family four packs to the Carolina Renaissance Festival going on now in Huntersville. We have just two packs left. For your chance to win, just head on over to Facebook and give us a like. That does it for us this week. From all of us at PBS Charlotte, thanks so much for your time. We look forward to seeing you back here again next time on Carolina Impact. Good night, my friends. Funding for Carolina Impact is provided by the members of WTVI PBS Charlotte and by the Philip L. Van Avery Foundation is pleased to support our region's arts organizations and artists with profiles and feature stories on Carolina Impact. A production of WTVI-PBS Charlotte.